Good morning, everyone. And I hope everyone had a very nice Mother's Day and you found some time to celebrate the moms in your life. So as we talked about on Friday, our data continues to show we're moving in the right direction and slowing the spread of the virus. In fact, we have the third lowest rate of case growth in the country. And yesterday, we had no positive tests or deaths reported. But as I've said, we must still be cautious and Vermonters must still remain vigilant, knowing how this virus has affected some of our neighboring states. It's really important to remember there's been about 45,000 deaths within a radius of 350 miles of us here in Vermont. So even as we continue to reopen, I urge Vermonters not to let up on physical distancing, washing your hands, staying home when ill, limiting travel, and wearing masks when around others. Because it's, because it's due to these types of precautions and the sacrifice that Vermonters have made that even with what we're seeing in other states, we could continue to slowly reopen. So you can expect when the emergency order is extended on Friday, it will include additional openings. And I want to share some of those steps with you today. I've asked the Agency of Commerce to work with the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety to develop and release guidance this week for a gradual reopening of retail one week from today on May 18th. It's important to note that when we do reopen, they, they will need to meet or exceed the same health and safety requirements all other businesses and nonprofits have had to meet thus far. So all employees will be required to wear a facial covering and everyone must maintain a minimum distance of six feet between themselves. And for this first uh, phase of reopening, there will also be an occupancy limit, meaning no more than 25% of their maximum legal capacity. Operations must have and abide by a detailed COVID-19 health and safety training or if they have fewer than 10 employees, they can use the Department of Labor's VOSHA course, which you can find at labor.vermont.gov. And remember, while there would be mass requirements for employees, we're still encouraging customers to cover up as well. Again, to be clear, the guidance we will release uh, this week is under development by the Agency of Commerce in coordination with Dr. Levine's team at the Health Department and Commissioner Shirley's team at the Department of Public Safety. While I know many are eager to shop for clothing and other supplies, waiting a week gives these businesses time to develop their safety plans, do their training, modify their store, stores, and work with the agency to understand all the steps needed to reopen and operate safely. As with all of the state steps we've taken, it also gives us time to closely monitor the data and adjust if we need to. Because we want to make sure the steps we've already taken, like opening thousands of jobs in manufacturing, construction, and some medical services, are not having a negative impact on the rate of spread, hospitalization rates, or other trends. As I said many times, our decisions are going to be driven by the data and the science and the recommendations of our experts. And by taking a cautious approach, we'll be stronger and healthier when we get to the finish line. Instead of taking two steps forward and one step back, we've chosen to take one and a half steps forward without having to retreat. So speaking of data, science and experts, I've also asked Dr. Levine to give us an update today on our expanded testing program. We continue to work towards our goal of testing more than 1,000 Vermonters each day, which is essential to our ability to find, contain, and suppress this virus. Without a vaccine, testing is one of the keys to managing the virus over the long term and getting life back to normal. I've also asked Human Services Secretary Mike Smith to make sure Vermonters know what services they can access and when we hope to open up other services like dental care. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for an update on expanding testing. Uh, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. 
As you all know, we're on a mission to greatly increase the number of tests and expand the groups of people being covered and tested so we can quickly identify and isolate outbreaks of COVID-19 and better understand the extent of spread of the virus in our state. We expect there are many more people who are infected than the 900 plus who have tested positive to date. Our capacity for testing is no longer limited as it was at the start of the pandemic. We now have the ability to conduct 1,000 tests a day, and we are encouraging people with symptoms, no matter how mild, to call their health care provider for a referral to testing. And we are urging health care providers to refer their patients, including children, who have even mild symptoms for testing. The clinician will refer you to a hospital or health center near you that can perform the test at no cost. If you don't have a health care provider, call 211 to connect with a community or hospital connected clinic. And be aware that the list of symptoms recognized to be associated with COVID-19 has expanded. In addition to the triad of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, other symptoms can include chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell. When you receive the test, it will be the PCR nasal swab test, which tells you if you have a current infection. It is not a serology or antibody test from the blood, which means it will not tell you if you were infected in the past. The working group that I had convened several weeks ago to examine those tests is meeting again later this week. We are also now testing all staff in all correctional facilities, as well as every person in a prison, long-term care facility, or other group setting where even one person, resident or staff, has tested positive. And we've begun offering testing to asymptomatic frontline workers at a series of pop-up testing sites around the state. Just on Saturday, we hosted the second such event in the Health Department lab parking lot in Colchester. In spite of polar vortex conditions, Health Department staff and EMS volunteers collected samples from 138 first responders, healthcare workers, and providers of childcare for essential workers. We have three more pop-up testing events coming this week Tuesday at Bennington College, Thursday at Brattleboro Union High School, and Saturday at the Upper Valley Aquatic Center in White River Junction. Again, staffed by Health Department with help from EMS and Vermont National Guard volunteers. These pop-up events are by appointment only for symptom-free first responders, including EMS, fire, and law enforcement, healthcare workers, and child care providers serving essential workers. One of our highest priorities for prevention is to make sure people returning to Vermont from another state, those who may have spent the winter outside of Vermont, second homeowners, or college students, quarantine themselves for 14 days. In a novel program now, if they are without symptoms of COVID at day seven of their quarantine, we are allowing them to be tested at one of these pop-up sites. And if their test is negative, they will be free to end their quarantine period. If you are a first responder, healthcare worker, child care provider, or returning from another state and without symptoms, who will be at day seven of your quarantine, you can schedule an appointment now. The Department of Human Resources has set up an online portal humanresources.vermont.gov slash popups. I'd like to move now to talking a little more about some general concepts and principles. With Governor Scott's gradual and careful turn of the spigot to safely restart Vermont and reconnect Vermonters, it's really now more important than ever that we all do everything we can 
to keep this virus from sparking up again and spreading in our communities. This means each of us must stay home and away from others if you're sick or have recently been in contact with someone who has COVID-19. And again, if you have any symptoms, call your health care provider and ask to be referred for testing. Wash hands often and well for two full minutes with soap and water or use a hand sanitizer if soap and water are not at hand. Wear a facial covering when you're around people outside of your household. It is the new fashion and keep a physical distance of at least six feet from others. Proof that Vermonters are actually taking these measures seriously are in the thoughtful questions they have been asking and that we are receiving from them. Following are some basic guidelines from those questions about when, where, and how to wear a mask. Always have a full face, cover a face covering with you when you go out. Keep it around your neck, in your pocket, or bag. Even if you're out alone in the open air, be ready to slip it on when you happen to be near others. If you enter an enclosed space with other people, put it on and keep it on. Make room for all. We commonly get questions about people on trails and in other public settings. Just like how we pull over to make room for emergency vehicles, if you're out someplace like a narrow trail or bike path, pull over and walk, jog, or ride in single file when passing by others. Maximize the space available. Know when to wear the facial cover. Even in small gatherings of 10 or fewer people, you should still keep your physical distance and wear the facial cover. When you're alone, of course, or with members of your own household, you can go without. And know how to wear it. It should fully cover your nose and mouth and be snug enough that it won't slip down as you talk or move. Understand that some people should not wear a mask. Children under age two, pregnant people, and those who have trouble breathing but it's all the more important that the rest of us do so to protect them. Keep your social circle small. This will make it easier to know who else may have been exposed and needs to self-isolate if someone gets sick. Choose one other trusted household that is also taking health and safety precautions. This could be another family or members of your own family who live in a separate household. People over age 65 and with underlying medical conditions are more likely to develop more severe illness and should continue to stay home. Find ways to connect by phone, computer, or video. And finally, as I mentioned at the end of last week, keep a daily log of your contacts, of any people outside of your household that you've been in close contact with. That way, if you do become ill, it will be easier to know who else may be at risk of contracting the virus and allow the health department to more quickly and accurately conduct contact tracing. As health commissioner, I wish to thank you for all that you're doing to keep yourselves and others safe and healthy. I recognize how tremendous a sacrifice this has been and urge you all to keep it up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Smith, uh, Secretary of Human Services. I just wanted to take a moment to remind Vermonters and healthcare providers what services we have allowed to resume, those that we're working on to possibly allow in the future, and what services are still closed due to COVID-19. As you remember last week, working with providers represented by the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, the Vermont Medical Society, Bi-State Primary Care Association, and Health First, we began allowing certain health care services in Vermont that were dis discontinued at the outset of the COVID-19 virus impacting that were impacting Vermonters. Last week on May 4th, we announced that limited elective medical procedures could resume on a clinic or outpatient basis as long as the health care provider adhered to guidelines issued by the Commissioner of the Department of Health. As was articulated, though these were intended 
uh, as physician and hospital medical based elective services, but the guidance broadly defined healthcare workers as nurses, physicians, emergency medical personnel, medical and nursing students, laboratory technicians, pharmacists, hospital volunteers, administrative staff, or any other employee who may come in contact with a patient. The Secretary of State's Office through the Office of Professional Regulation has inquired about the applicability of the resumption of certain health care services to other clinical services such as acupuncturists, applied behavior analysts, chiropractic services, hearing aid dispensers, naturopathic services, ophthalmology, uh, uh, Osteo, um, so, and physical therapy, uh, psychoanalysts, psycho, uh, psychological examiners, and others. We will, the Commissioner of Health issued guidance to the Office of Professional Regulation last week to send out to these other uh, clinical services. The Commissioner stated that he will continue to work with the Office of Professional Regulation to send out a message to make clear to their health provider licensees that they must adhere to the guidance published last Monday and actually making many of those practices closed as a practical manner. manner. Um, also draft, the commissioner will help, help and guide draft specific, sector specific guidance that will allow their licensees to safely see patients and then help with the drafting of guidance for dental community for the time being for them to resume services as well. Therefore, many of the healthcare services under the auspices of the Office of Professional Regulation remain closed until sector specific guidance can be established and approved by the Commissioner of Health, ensuring that they can safely open while COVID-19 remains a health threat to Vermonters. Let me also address the issue of dentistry. On Monday, May 4th, uh, when Governor Scott announced that limited elect elective medical procedures could resume, this did not include routine or non-urgent dental procedures, only emergency and urgent dental care. Although the governor's order to postpone routine or non-urgent dental care currently extends until midnight, May 15th, I want to emphasize this. It would be premature to conclude that this ban will be lifted at that time. I have seen some dental practices and notices to their patients that they intend to resume non-urgent dental procedures on May 18th. That decision to open dental offices to non-urgent procedures has not yet been made, and I would caution practices for making premature announcements. The state thanks the countless dental professionals who continue to observe the important limitations now in place. So here is what is happening. The health department is working with the Office of Professional Regulation and members of the Board of Dental Examiners to develop evidence-based recommendation for reopening. The Board of Dental Examiners will convene a virtual board meeting on Monday the 12th to deliberate on guidelines and advise the governor on the best guidelines for future reopening. I also want to be clear on the issue of what is called PPE, which is personal protective equipment, not to be confused with PPP, the, um, the unemployment uh, program. Just, just so that everyone knows, I want to um, talk about PPP, PPE for those healthcare organizations authorized to reopen. When allowed, the healthcare entity is expected to adhere to the guidelines issued for the reopening. We understand that some may not wish or will find it difficult to reopen under the guidelines. However, these guidelines are in place to protect Vermonters. 
the state will not be able to provide PPE for elective, routine, or non-urgent health care. Worldwide supply lines remain impaired, and the state warehouse stock must be directed to frontline COVID workers and outbreak response and prevention efforts. To safely offer elective, non-urgent health care services in compliance with the commissioner's guidance, health care providers must obtain the necessary PPE through their own sources and suppliers. And lastly, last week when we announced the opening of some elective procedures, either in a clinical sex, uh, setting or in outpatient settings, we stated that this was phase one of a two-phase strategy, with the second phase being the, open, the opening of elective procedures on an inpatient basis. Of course, with the proper guidelines to ensure patient safety and to be ready in case of a surge in capacity should there be a flare-up of the virus. We are still evaluating the impact on the healthcare system and the impacts on our effective containment and mitigations, mitigation strategies for the most recent announcement on elective surgeries. But if the data continues to be favorable, we could see inpatient elective procedures being allowed in the near future. Although we have had encouraging results in the past few weeks, primarily because of the virus mitigation and containment strategies that we put in, put in place, the virus still remains, remains amongst us. So these measures and processes are important to protect Vermonters. This we will be resolute in achieving and deciding what and when to reopen these various entities. I do want to thank you all for your time. I know it's been a, a difficult period for both patients and providers. I just wanted to spend a few minutes making sure that everyone understood where we stood in terms of reopening our health care system. Thank you, Secretary Smith. We'll now open it up to questions. Calvin? Um, Governor, on Friday, uh, regarding the Department of Labor, we still have this backlog. You uh, said that the Department of Labor had until, again, Saturday night to clear this backlog, and everybody still left over will be transferred to the PUA. Um, how many people were, were left over, and sort of what's the uh, latest on that? Yeah, from what I understand, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Harrington to uh, also expand upon this, but uh, from what I understand, they were successful in taking about 9,000 uh, claimants, and they are now being pushed into the PUA, uh, have been push, pushed into the PUA. Um, they are doing some testing over the day today, um, and hopefully once they get the testing done, then the applicant, the claimant, uh, can finish their filing, which takes uh, little or no time, can do it uh, online, and uh, just to, to get through that uh, one last step. But uh, it looks as though it was successful, uh, and they'll be able to, 9,000 more claimants will receive benefits this week. Uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, I believe you said it best, Governor. Um, again, uh, we expect that that number is somewhere around 9,000, give or take. Um, there were some people who were, um, who still fall into our adjudications process, um, but the majority, if not, you know, almost 90% of all of those are going to um, be put into the system if they haven't been already. And uh, once the testing, um, both for that group and for our uh, updated payment process is done, uh, those people will, will receive a notification uh, letting them know that they can uh, complete the rest of their, their application, the PUA portion of their application. And then uh, just a quick follow-up. <clears throat> um, every time we code around these issues, right, or kind of clear these issues and take it into our own hands, um, you and the commissioner have said that it, we, we risk basically retaliation from the federal government, uh, whether it's them rescinding benefits or some sort of thing. I guess at what point um, do we stop 
coding around or stop, uh, I guess, trying to go around the system if uh, the, or because of the risk uh, of, of retaliation from the federal government is too great? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, we've chosen to put people over policy uh, in this case and trying to get money in the hands of Vermonters that they desperately need and, and it's long overdue. So uh, we'll continue down this path until everyone receives the benefits that they are entitled to. So uh, it might be a little bit longer, but every, every week it seems as though we're able to do the workarounds and start to clear up some of those cases. Uh, once the uh, once the overall all uh, um, ramp up swell of, of the number of people uh, coming into the system starts to uh, decline, and we'll see some of that. I mean, we'll put a lot of people back to work today, so uh, common sense would tell you that we should be able to see some of our unemployment numbers drop. And when that happens, and when we bring more of the uh, the call takers from Maximus uh, online as well, we'll be able to use our experts uh, to go back through and make sure that we're getting the people in the right categories and uh, and taking a look to make sure that it's appropriate. So it's going to take a little bit more time, um, but first first things first, getting money in the hands of Vermonters that uh, we are entitled and we should uh, we should provide for that. And just one last follow-up. Is it have to date, have we res uh, seen any retaliation from the federal government? I think the federal government is fairly busy in all the states uh, because everyone has been impacted by the, the vast uh, number of people who have uh, uh, signed up for unemployment. So we're not alone. It's going to take them some time to, uh, to come back in and take a look and, and to uh, account for this. So I think it'll be a little bit uh, of time before that happens. Stuart? Thanks. Um, Governor, the AARP this morning added its um, name and voice to the controversy over voting by mail in November. Um, reading your letter Friday night, it appears you are holding firm to not wanting to make the decision before the August primary. Their point seems to be that you could make a decision in the middle of August and then have uh, an outbreak on the 1st of October and seniors would be terrified about going to the polls. What is your response to that, uh, given that this is a fluid situation and, and, and the need to protect the, the vote? Yeah, well, again, what, what I've said is let's move forward, just like we did with every other emergency situation. Uh, let's put the plan in place. Uh, let's, uh, let's get the ballots. Let's get the machines. Get, let's get everything that we need in place like we're going to do it. But I'm just saying we can't print the ballots until after the primary anyhow. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the the August uh, primary myself. I mean, there's still 100 or 200,000 people who are going to vote in that election. So I'm, I'm concerned about that one first. But having said that, um, we do have uh, absentee ballots uh, that uh, could be available for that. Uh, and uh, the Secretary of State doesn't seem to be as concerned about that one as the general. So uh, he's the expert. I'll take, uh, I'll take his advisement on that. We'll get through the the primary, and then you'll determine who is on in, in line on the general, uh, and then you'll have to print the ballots at that point. So I'm just saying at that point we can just determine uh, whether to continue down this path as we started with this uh, plan in place or not. We will know a lot more. Just think back. I mean, it was just two, two and a half months ago, less than two months ago, or just a little bit more than two months ago, that we started uh, down this path was March 13th that the uh, state of emergency came into place. We'll know a lot more uh, in August about where we're going uh, with this, whether there's more testing uh, in place and so forth. And, and again, I'm not saying no. Uh, I'm not, uh, this isn't philosophical. Uh, this isn't uh, political. I'm just saying we don't need to make this the, the final decision until August. Um, so it seems pretty easy to me, move down this path, put the plan in place, like you're going to do it, but in August make the final decision as to whether uh, it's going to happen in um, November, because there still is a primary to go through in between that time. But even in August, you would still have the risk of a late-breaking outbreak that you couldn't well, foresee. We, we run the risk every single day, right? We don't know where this is going. There are so many variables in this, uh, this whole pandemic. Um, but, but I can't tell you what, what's going to happen a year from then either. Uh, I can't tell you what's happening next week. Um, so we're just watching the trends, uh, the data and the science. It's, uh, it's, 
it, I believe uh, that uh, the measures we've taken thus far have kept us safe, um, and we'll we'll determine that from my perspective in August. And and uh, I would add that um, that I wasn't added into this process until the legislature took action on another bill, and in, and in, with an amendment uh, put me in place uh, with my uh, with my approval moving forward on any of these elections coming up. Um, I'm just saying I'm not comfortable making this decision right now. If the legislature wants to take other action, I'm not going to stand in their way. If they want to take this in bill form and force this election uh, in, in uh, November, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I will not stand in the way of that happening. Just to clarify, so you, aren't, are you taking a risk then by, by holding up the decision until August when you might have an outbreak at the last what, minute? What, what's the risk? Well, you wouldn't be ready to pull the trigger. Yep, we would be, though. I'm saying start today, like we're going to do it. Today. Make the decision. I said this last week. Just move forward, like it's going to happen in November. But not, not say yes for certain until August. But, I, but I'm not standing in the way at all. Steve? Uh, Governor, uh, as of uh, today, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Bishop, in Burlington has allowed the, uh, the various churches to open under pretty strict conditions and everything, uh, a limit of 10 people in the church at a time. And uh, there are a lot of folks in, who really want to get to church. Um, and they're large buildings. So what what is going to be happening with the churches? Uh, yeah. Have we gotten any guidance on that? It, it, will, it will come in time. I mean, I, I think what you'll see with all our, of our approaches, uh, they're very measured, right? Moderate uh, stances. So for in terms of retail, for instance, we're opening that up to 25% to of whatever the occupancy is. I, can, I think you can expect that we'll be, we'll be doing that with other uh, areas as well. Uh, social distancing, making sure people are wearing masks, so forth and so on. Um, so we're taking this one step at a time. Uh, at this point, uh, we have uh, a limit of, of 10, uh, mass gatherings of 10. I would expect, uh, as we did when we first started with, I, I don't even remember what it was in the beginning, whether it was 100 or 250, uh, but we stepped down from there. And we got all the way down from 250 to 100 to 50 to, to, uh, to 10 uh, eventually. Uh, so I think what you'll see is the same type of ramp up uh, from there so that we can continue to take these minor steps as we uh, move forward uh, to make sure that we're watching the data and the science to be sure that there's not any negative effects. So I think you can, you can expect uh, with the churches in particular, uh, we would be doing the same thing, you know, going from 10 to maybe 25 to maybe 50 and moving in that in that way. So you're thinking percentage is 25% of the capacity of the building? Or? Well, that's what we're considering. That's what we're doing for retail, right. for instance, because it's very difficult because they're all different sizes of uh, retail. And if you limited it to just 10, for instance, uh, the, the ones with 100,000 square feet, uh, you'd be pretty lonely in a building like that. And 10 would be overwhelming in a small retail sh uh, store. So we thought, Having it uh, determined by the uh, percentage of occupancy uh, would be the better approach. We move to the phones now. We have Avery WCAX. Um, my question is around the reopening of dental practices. So, as Secretary Smith mentioned, the stock of P PPE is, is limited. What can you say to dental hygienists and dentists who are kind of nervous about reopening and where they will be able to get PPE from? Secretary Smith. Not everybody's going to be able to comply with these guidelines. We recognize that. Um, the various practices are going to have to make a decision of whether they can comply with the guidances the guidances that we put out. That includes PPE as we move forward on this. But they're going to have to make the decision of whether they can comply or not. And if they can't comply, then they will have to make the decision of what they're going to do, either reach out and try to get some supplies of PPE or not open. Our main concern, especially with dentistry, is the, the 
both the employees of the dentist, the dental hygienist, as well as the dentist, but also the people that are um, the patients that are coming here. This is a very close contact with, an, with the mouth, and we want to make sure that, um, and I'm not the doctor, I'll let Dr. Levine talk about the sort of the, the, um, the medical science of this. We just want to make sure that there is uh, sufficient protections for everyone. So to answer your question, um, we're not saying you have to open. We're just saying how you have to open, and how you have to open is with PPE. Thank you. Erin Vermont Digger. Um, my question pertains to the uh, retail store reopening. I've, um, I've been speaking to experts about this topic, and one thing they seem to believe as a general rule is that we can't do retail reopening no matter what social distancing guidelines we have in place without job protections like sick leave or the ability to stay home if workers feel unsafe. Are there any considerations specifically for hourly workers about those job protections, any considerations of expanding the job protections that they have for a response to that uh, assessment? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, if you go back to the guidance and some of the safety plans, uh, it would talk about uh, those safety precautions that we're asking to be put in place. Um, I'd be curious as to who the experts are you're speaking with and some of the experts we're talking with uh, feel as though uh, the retail would be uh, safe under the guidance that's being put forward. Aaron, do you have? Well, to, do you have I any think experts? that it it has a lot to do with the um, you know the feeling that if people are forced to go into work when they don't feel well or when they have underlying health conditions, it could lead to long term problems for a second wave. Yeah, well, again, I'd be interested in who the experts are, but um, what has been laid out in the guidance is if you don't feel well, we're saying don't come in. Um, so employees are asked oh. to stay home if that's the case uh, as well. There are a number of provisions in place uh, to protect uh, employees, but um, uh, again, there's nothing perfect uh, about this system. Uh, we don't, uh, we're learning more every single day. Um, the, the science uh, seems to change a bit, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we continue to see a record low number of uh, positives in this state. Uh, again, yesterday we had zero uh, with zero deaths. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to change. I've been saying all along that uh, the more we open up some of the uh, businesses and, and manufacturing, construction, and so forth, uh, we and, and expand our testing that we are going to see uh, more positives in this state. Uh, but at the, until there's a vaccine in place, I'm not sure that we can fully, fully uh, stop this from from spreading. I might ask Dr. Levine if there's anything else I'm missing on that. Anything more? I, I mean, I'm trying to be clear, um, Aaron, but have I answered the question? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I'd, be, I'd be curious what specific provisions you have in the new guidance related to, you know, protecting employees. You're, are you just referring to social distancing protocols? Well, the mass uh, social distancing, uh, taking uh, t temperatures, for instance, is some of the manufacturing construction entities, uh, but uh, knowing that thermometers are in short supply, I mean, we're trying to take steps to protect uh, both employees and customers as well. Um, we are encouraging uh, those, uh, those businesses to adopt measures like Costco did, uh, some other uh, stores have done, uh, to make sure they have um, facial coverings when they come into their places of business, but, uh, but that part is up to them. Uh, again, uh, those with chronic conditions uh, and so forth, I believe, um, and maybe Commissioner Harrington can weigh in, but I believe those with chronic conditions uh, that would uh, would prevent them from going back into work. Uh, they could continue to stay uh, continue to stay on unemployment. Am I correct on that, Commissioner Harrington? Uh, yes, sir. So if uh, if an individual felt like they were being placed in undue harm 
Um, however, if the employer was taking all the necessary steps, following CDC guidance, fo following the Department of Health's guidance and um, Vermont's Occupational Safety and Health Administration protocols and guidance, then um, again, that that would allow them the opportunity to go back to work. So they would have to be able to to validate or show that the the employer was not taking the appropriate safety precautions. Okay, and um, how is the state setting to enforce these rules? Um, I, sorry, Did I interrupt someone? Nope, still here. It's still listening. Um, my my understanding is that right now uh, OSHA is providing guidance to employees, but not holding them to a specific standard. Is that still accurate? Well, they have to submit a plan, uh, and they have to adhere to the plan that they've submitted, and, and it has to be approved before they open their place of business. So I would say there's a few steps uh, that would would uh, prevent uh, or help uh, the employee in many respects uh, from contracting the virus. Uh, we want we do not want to put them in unsafe conditions. Uh, we That's why we're doing this in such a phase step process uh, to be sure we're, tr uh, we're both protecting the employee and the customers as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks very much. Uh, before I ask my question today, I was wondering if Commissioner Pichak could give us an update on the two statistics that were promised on Friday, the number of out-of-staters that tested positive in Vermont but uh, were sent out of state, uh, and the number of Vermonters that tested positive out of state, and those tests have been shared with Vermont. Uh, and I must say, I was shocked when uh, your office uh, commissioner uh, sent me an email on Friday saying they would have to coordinate your response with the health department uh, about the public statistics. I'm just wondering why these public numbers are so elusive uh, when you do your weekly projection. Mike, can I just, this is Rebecca, I'm sorry. Can I just make sure we're all understanding your question because I think that might be part of the challenge here. Um, are you asking if the total number of cases that we are reporting is not in fact the total number of positive tests that we that the health department finds. Is that what your question is? Uh, well, I'm not sure what the numbers are. I, to be honest, I'm totally confused by the, the reporting numbers, and that's why we're trying to get at these. We were told, Commissioner Levine at one point said, the numbers that uh, out-of-staters that were here in Vermont, such as workers, tourists, family visiting long-term that test positive and live out-of-state, those numbers were sent back to those states and were not included in the Vermont numbers, even though, say, 200, 300 people might have tested positive here, they were not included in the county yeah. by county numbers or whatever. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith, one of the two, uh, because I don't believe well, that's actually, the case. Actually, ask Commissioner Pichak about it. Yeah. I mean, it's well, his projection. That yeah, he can, he can weigh in as well, I mean, but I first want to make sure that we're we're solid on this. Uh, I believe that everyone who is has tested positive in the state is listed as being positive in the state, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer first. So in our total numbers, those include every positive test in the state. However, we do also report back to the state of origin if there is a positive test for a resident of their state. And to answer the question about modeling, we use the total number because anyone that is in Vermont that receives a positive test has the possibility of transmission in the state, even if they are only here temporarily. Um, and each one of our modelers doesn't distinguish between in-state or out-of-state residents. It's really confirmed tests in your state. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why I want to make sure that we're apples and apples here. So, Commissioner Levine, if I can just double check on what you just said. So, if somebody is on a work crew construction company here temporarily or was a tourist and they happen to be living in Chittenden County or staying in Chittenden County or Grand Isle County or wherever, those positive tests would show up in the county by county stats that you've been releasing? 
They, they show up as the, in the total number of positive tests in the state. And as I said on Friday, our health surveillance section is going to be connecting with you so we can be very specific about all the different categories. Uh, they could not do that Friday, and they will be doing it this week. Well, I was interested in, in the commissioner's projections and what he's basing those on. Not, uh, I wasn't looking for a coordinated response between the two departments, but what Commissioner Pichak was basing his projections on. Yeah, so, so I, was I think I'll just that you have to coordinate. <laughs> well, no, I, don't, I just wanted to be clear. We're doing it on the total number. We don't. We don't. None of our modelers nor. Do we break it down by in-state or out-of-state? So that information would have to come most reliably from the health department. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that's pretty much the clearest answer I can give. Okay. Well, I'll wait for the response whenever it comes. So uh, the question today, uh, the number of people still not wearing masks is, seems to be troubling. And now you're going to have more retail opening and everything like that. I stop when I stop at traffic lights. I look at the convenience stores nearby and see most people walk in without masks on. And I don't think it's going to get any better with retail opening. And uh, I stopped at one store and counted 12 people going in. 10 did not wear masks. And when I spoke to the store clerk, she said, "Yeah, that's about average." I'm just wondering. Uh, how you're going to be able to somehow get compliance and uh, could the legislature or the governor or somebody uh, mandate or sign legislation that would allow the stores to charge, say, an extra 10 percent for those coming through the checkout without a mask and that that money would be used to help fund the hazardous pay that, you're, that has been proposed? Mike, uh, from my standpoint, I continue uh, to try and promote the gui guidance and education as my first step. Um, we'll watch the data, uh, watch the science, and if, if we see uh, that we're having a problem, we're seeing uh, a difficulty in, in our compliance uh, rates, uh, then we'd have to take more steps. But that's not my first, um, first preference. So. We'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, obviously, the legislature can, uh, can propose anything it wants uh, in terms of making this mandatory uh, for all Vermonters. Uh, but, uh, but what I'm seeing, uh, again, across the country, uh, this is having mixed results. Uh, it creates a lot of controversy. Uh, it puts people at odds. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that it's counterproductive to what we're trying to do today. Uh, I think the more people wear masks, uh, the more socially acceptable it is. And uh, that's why we're making it mandatory for the businesses that are opening back up. Uh, and I believe mm -hmm. that there'll be some social acceptance uh, eventually. Um, but, uh, but again, it's, it's difficult. Culture change is difficult. But I'm seeing more masks today than I saw a month ago. And I would expect in another month's time, I'd see more than I see today. Um, so, again, that's my prerogative. Uh, if the legislature decides to take uh, additional steps to make this mandatory or, or have some, uh, some type of a, a scheme to, to force people to do this, um, that's, that's their prerogative as well. And, uh, and I'll consider that uh, if it comes across my desk. Well, a 10% surcharge wouldn't be mandatory. It would be that the, the customer would have a choice. That's not making it mandatory. but. Well, it's kind of making it want to pay it's kind of making it mandatory. I mean, in terms of charging more. Again, uh, if that's what the legislature wants to do, um, that's that's something that I would consider. But that wouldn't be my first choice. We've got to Great. Move Thank you very much. To the next questioner, Courtney, seven days. Uh, hi, Governor. You might have addressed this um, with the last question. But it's a little bit hard to hear you, so maybe if you could step a little closer to the mic. Um, but could you clarify why are employees at retail shops required to wear masks but not customers? And I'm sorry if you just addressed this, but again, it was a little bit hard to hear you. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I don't know if others are having trouble, but I'm literally about eight inches away from the mics right now, so I don't want to get any closer. Um, 
I would um, again offer uh, that this is a way for us uh, to induce uh, some education. Uh, we can have some control over the employees and so forth. Uh, it's not a step I want to take, forcing Vermonters uh, to take this step to mandatory face coverings. Um, if we see that it becomes, if the, if the science and there's evidence that would, uh, that would support this in the future, we might have to change. But at this point in time, I think education and guidance is the best, best approach. Uh, Vermonters have done very well thus far. Our compliance rate is one of the highest in the nation as well uh, we are we are seeing the results of that we are seeing uh, zero like i said yesterday uh, we saw zero positives and uh, zero deaths so uh, there's not many other states that can uh, uh, that have that going for them and uh, and i'm very proud of what everyone's doing so we'll continue uh, with this approach and hopefully uh, that will be more socially acceptable in the future and the culture will change, and, uh, and this will become more habit forming. Um, just a quick follow up to that: Are you are you concerned, or have you already heard about conflicts if a store such as Costco has instituted its own mask policy, but a customer who wants to shop there refuses to put one on because it's not mandated? Well, Is that's that something that you're hearing about, and does that concern yeah. you? No, that, that's what I had answered uh, before. I think it. It sets, us, sets up a controversy uh, that, uh, and conflict uh, that I don't think is necessary. And uh, I haven't seen that in the state. I don't know if that's, uh, that's happened in, in Vermont, but I have seen that uh, across uh, some of the national reports where we're seeing some controversy and conflict between store clerks and uh, customers. So I would like to avoid that and continue to try and give guidance and education as to why it's an important thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Okay, we'll go to Sean at the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, Governor, this morning we got a call from a reader who said he had just seen road crews working on Route 11 uh, here in Andover. Uh, and that's always a cause for celebration around here. But he also noticed the trucks that were doing the work bore New York State plates. Now, we haven't had a chance to verify this yet, but you've spoken many times about Vermont being surrounded by states where there are more infections than Vermont. So our reader wondered why the state would bring workers in from out of state, and also what restrictions do they have to observe, especially if they're staying here longer than just the day that they're working and going home? Yeah, they're under the same restrictions as everyone else. Um, what, uh, when you have a contract, uh, you have a contractor from another state that bids on a project in Vermont, uh, they are allowed to obviously uh, perform the duties of, under the contract. Uh, we have asked uh, that they have a higher level of compliance in, to, in terms of uh, the safety measures uh, surrounding the COVID-19. Uh, so they've taken courses individually. And, uh, and we've, uh, again, asked for anyone coming into the state to, um, uh, unless it's for, for work purposes, we've, we've also had a little bit of leeway uh, throughout this whole uh, process because, as you might recall, there are some from Plattsburgh, let's say, uh, that work at uh, uh, UVM Medical Center, uh, as well as those who are from Vermont that might work at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, so we have uh, allowed for a little bit of variance, uh, but in this case, we're asking those uh, those companies to to not uh, commute and for them to come into the state and stay a while. So if they're coming into the state and they're staying a while, have they already quarantined for 14 days? Well, that's our hope. Uh, obviously, uh, the, nothing perfect about this system, and there are no, nobody is uh, verifying in some respects. Uh, but we're asking these uh, businesses uh, to come up with their own uh, plans uh, that are approved, and they are adhering to the plans. So, so there's no, there's no verification, and I mean, you've spoken about embers coming from other states. There's no verification that we couldn't have an ember on Route 11 in. Um, in 
in Andover. Yeah, and that's in anticipation of some of what we're going to see in the future. That's why we've increased our testing and tracing uh, capacity and program because we want to make sure that we're out there being proactive and to try and identify some of these embers as they come into our state because we haven't, from the very beginning, we haven't had anyone verifying uh, anyone coming into the state uh, from other, other states at our ports of entry uh, to determine whether they are uh, indeed coming in and, uh, and um, quarantining, quarantining or not. So uh, this is not a perfect system, uh, and uh, admittedly so. And we're trying to do the best we can under the conditions uh, to try and, again, uh, continue to have the, the, one of the best, uh, highest compliance in the, in the nation. Uh, as well as some of the lowest rates uh, in the nation uh, in terms of uh, positive and, uh, and the number of deaths. Just the last thing, so are, are these workers who are under contract coming in from out of state being tested? Um, th they are not at this point in time. Some of them could be, um, but uh, we're hoping uh, to expand the testing enough so that uh, we can have more universal testing in the future. Uh, so that we can uh, provide for some of what we're seeing, uh, some of these uh, businesses that are coming in. But, uh, but it's not universal uh, at this point, but that's, uh, that's where we're going, hopefully going in the future. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, good morning. Uh, Dr. Levine, there was a report uh, in the paper this morning, about a third of Americans believe there is a vaccine and it's not being used, which I guess tells us something about the state of the nation at the moment. Um, I was wondering if we are holding out too much hope for a vaccine. There's not a vaccine for HIV, AIDS, uh, Lyme disease, or any other coronavirus. Should, should we better assume that there will not be a vaccine and just go from there? Those are great questions. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if the third of Americans were correct? Um, but unfortunately, uh, you're right. There is no vaccine now. And, you know, in the rosiest of pictures where there would be a vaccine, I think people are often being sometimes falsely misled, other times just having a false sense of hope that that vaccine would be readily available. And vaccines go through such extensive testing uh, that the minimum point would be a year, and most people are talking in terms of one to two years. But your observation about other coronaviruses is correct. Um, it's not the same as uh, some of the other viral illnesses that we clearly do have vaccines established for. I don't want to relate it to HIV because that, that's a very different type of virus, but at the same time, your conclusion is correct. HIV has been around a long, long time, and we do not have a vaccine uh, to offer anybody at this point in time. So I would still try to err on the side of being optimistic about a vaccine for coronavirus um, based on its uh, structural properties, but at the same time, not being um, overly optimistic about the timeline part of it because to think about within a year, um, while it would be wonderful, uh, it really wouldn't be that plausible to me. It'd be in the couple year window. Having said that though, that doesn't mean we wouldn't have more effective antiviral therapeutics developed within that time period. So even if we don't have a vaccine as quickly as we'd like it, we might have medications and other treatments that would be successful in treating coronavirus of this sort so that we would at least have something to offer people other than the kind of supportive care we're offering right now. Do you think those antivirals would be better if, you know, we've talked about a, a second wave in the fall or perhaps next winter. Do you think there will be that, those kind of treatments available by then? Uh, I'm very optimistic there will be. There have been trials that are ongoing as we speak that are being done in very rapid fashion, even under extreme circumstances, if you will. There was actually in the New England Journal of Medicine a trial just reported uh, out of China that uh, sort of at the peak of the issues in Wuhan, uh, this 
they were able to carry out a clinical trial. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out as positively as people would have wanted with the drugs that were used, but the fact that it could be done under those circumstances at all was great testimony to the uh, whole medical and scientific community there. I'll also say that the federal government has uh, notified states, and we are one of the states, that uh, we'll be receiving a shipment of uh, the one antiviral drug that uh, has recently been studied and found to be effective in shortening the duration of symptoms in people who are hospitalized with severe illness. Uh, and so our hospitals in Vermont will, this week actually, uh, have access to that medication. Is that the remdesivir? Remdesivir, yes. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, Joe Barton Chronicle. I believe this is another question for Dr. Levine, um, in a way following from the last round. Um, in the beginning of your um, remarks this morning, you talked about additional symptoms that people should be alert to, and it makes me uh, ask um, what has been learned about the virus in the past few months that um, was not understood at the beginning of this, and what major questions remain um, about its operation on the human body, and how do both this new knowledge and these big questions affect the decisions that are being made about how to react to um, the pandemic. Wow. Do you have a few hours? Uh, I will. I've got all the time in the world. <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, let's start with symptoms, since that's what triggered the conversation. Um, you know, originally it was really a lot of emphasis put on fever, cough, shortness of breath. And as you heard, this list now has expanded quite a bit uh, to some things that we traditionally call viral illness in general. Um, when we look at our Vermont experience, and we've been putting out uh, notifications periodically as we accumulate more and more cases, uh, cough is rather common, but fever turned out to be uh, far less common than we anticipated which has big implications, of course, if everything that you're doing at a work site hinges on a person having a temperature or not, uh, because not all of them will have fever even if they are having symptoms of COVID that uh, are ongoing. So we've learned a lot about the symptom presentation. We've learned uh, that we were completely right with regard to the vulnerable population and who is going to get the most severe illness, who is going to get uh, into an ICU potentially, uh, who may not survive. Uh, we've learned a lot about that. We've learned a tremendous amount about how to protect the most vulnerable. And I think our track record has been quite good in Vermont with regard to long-term care facilities and other congregate settings, even like uh, correctional facilities, um, because around the country, this really is epidemic in uh, all of those sites, and you've heard news reports regarding that. Um, what we still don't know, um, you know, we've learned a little more about this pre-symptomatic time period of 48 hours, um, but, you know, is that really 48 hours? Should we be actually looking longer? Well, one of the principles of our new contact tracing program is we're going to look back 14 days, not necessarily because that one person may have been infectious that whole 14 days, but maybe we'll actually get at the cause of that localized outbreak by looking at the experience uh, 14 days back. We've also learned a lot about uh, when most people will become symptomatic, and it seems to be by day five or six, and really almost 100%, just shy of a couple percent, almost 100% will have been symptomatic by day 11 um, in this time course of illness. 
Um, the other thing we don't know as much as we'd like to know about is how much asymptomatic disease there is present in the population, not just in Vermont, but in general, and how much of a um, threat that is to the general population, if you will, if those people can eventually become uh, infectious or not. And we're learning more and more about the lack of disease in kids, uh, but at the same time, what are the implications of that for the adults? And are kids very capable uh, transmitters of virus, even if they don't appear to be ill at the time? Uh, we would love to learn more and more about that as well. Uh, so plenty of stuff that we're kind of becoming more and more aware of, plenty of stuff that we would still love to have answers for. And in terms of translating our management of the pandemic, I think the biggest things we want the answers for um, that no society can give us just quite yet is how to do exactly what you hear us talking about on the stage three times a week, how to restart Vermont, how to reopen business, how to do it in a phased and deliberate and cautious way uh, without letting that infectivity factor, the R naught, uh, increase or any of the other statistics that we follow uh, increase and how much within the population can we begin to congregate again in terms of these congregate settings, whether you talk 10, 25, 50, what have you, um, where, where will that go? How, how safely can we do that? Those are really um, answers that, unfortunately, the whole world is trying to find the answers simultaneously. And we try to learn from places that had an experience a little earlier than ours uh, and see what we can do in that regard. But those are really the, the very challenging questions that we're dealing with. And probably the most challenging will be which epidemic curve will coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 illness, I should say, follow? Will it be the initial peak that we've had and then months and months go by before another peak occurs? Will it be more off and on? Um, Lots of uh, modeling, lots of good guesswork by very well-intentioned and scientifically credible people, but the bottom line is we really don't know. And that's what we're going to be watching very, very carefully. And that's why all of our talk about increasing testing and increasing contact tracing is so important because if something should occur in the future with regard to a resurgence of disease, we want to know about it really early. Uh, and not uh, get to our crisis point in the management of that uh, subsequent resurgence. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that's enough to absorb for right now. Thank you very much, Doctor. All right, we're going to go back to Greg from the County Courier. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, I'm a little less prepared today than I, I normally am. Uh, as you know, I'm a volunteer firefighter, and I just got back from a fire call, which is why I wasn't able to connect earlier. Um, but it's also why uh, I have the question I have today. Um, I was fortunate to be one of the 138 uh, non-symptomatic people that were tested uh, over the weekend in Colchester. And um, I noticed that at no point did they actually ask the town of residents uh, that I was from. Um, and in the information that they collected, they, they asked for a mailing address. Uh, and I, I guess I'm under the assumption that in order to make the map that you've made public for where these cases are coming from, you're going by a mailing address or a zip code. Um, but that really brings up uh, an issue in Franklin County where uh, Georgia does not have its own post office, uh, either does uh, Fletcher. Uh, which are both showing zero cases. Um, so in the case of Georgia, if somebody gets a, a positive test in Georgia, it's actually going to come up as a St. Albans, Milton, or Fairfax uh, positive result. Um, in Enosburg, where I'm from, uh, our Enosburg post office serves parts of Franklin, Berkshire, Bakersfield, Montgomery, uh, Fairfield, and, and so, you know, it's showing that Enosburg has six cases, 
Uh, but it, it seems to me like that's a pretty flawed number because Sheldon uh, and I believe uh, Berkshire and, and maybe Montgomery uh, aren't showing any cases. So I'm wondering why you're not collecting data on where people live uh, and just maybe their mailing address. And if that kind of just highlights a little bit of a bigger problem in, in the sense that we're not collecting enough data uh, to really know where stuff is and, and what's going on. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Dr. Levine, first of all, thank you uh, very much for your public service and stepping up. We need more volunteers uh, doing their, their public duty and, and performing public service. But um, I would just add um, that we do collect the da data. Um, we, are, we do know uh, the number of positive cases that are in Vermont, first of all. And we know the region at that point. Um, and I would assume uh, that part of our tracing and testing program that we would then trace uh, from there if a positive case came up to determine who you came in contact with, uh, for instance. Uh, and at that point, uh, trying to, to make sure that we, uh, that we hunt it out and we try and find out who has the virus so we can contain it. Um, but I don't have the answers to the rest of it. I'll ask uh, Dr. Levine to answer. Yeah, thanks again for your service and for getting tested. Um, and may you not have a positive test, but my answer to your question, um, I'll make sure I'm correct and we'll get back to you if I'm not, but let's say you do become a positive test. That will precipitate a rather exhaustive interview over the telephone with one of our public health epidemiology staff. And I believe as part of the questioning that you're going to get, it will include where you live and then as the governor was just alluding to, who else lives with you there and go back in your history for all of the connections with other people that you might have. But if it starts with where do you live, the post office box was important to get because you're probably going to get a result sent to you if people can't get a hold of you any other way. But at the same time, on the phone call, it'll become much clearer where you are a resident of. So, uh, but, but you're still not gathering data as far as where the tests are coming from. So uh, I guess in your data, unless there's a positive, you wouldn't know that there's maybe 37, uh, you know, tests being taken from the town of Georgia, or 52 from the town of Fletcher. Right. We would, but we would know the county. Uh, well, you you might not know the county because uh, Georgia uh, is right on the border with Chittenden County, and if you live in the southern portion of Georgia, you actually have a Milton mailing address, even if you have a mailbox out in front of your house, it, it's technically a Milton mailing address. I, I get it. So we'll get back to you to see if there's anything more that we learn at the time of the testing. Uh, certainly if your test was because you had symptoms and your physician ordered the test, um, we would probably have more information regarding your town than in this kind of setting that we were just describing but I understand where you're coming from. All right, thank you guys. All right, uh, just a time check for everybody. It's 20 past 12 and we're only halfway through the questioners. Lisa, AP. Hi, Dr. Levine, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lisa. Hey, Dr. Yes, please ask your question. It looks like we had an increase in the number of cases uh, reported in Bennington over the weekend, um, Bennington County. And I was just wondering if there is if there anything going on there where they, you know, in a particular area, I think five of the six cases were in Bennington. Sure. So I don't know if all five of the six uh, fall under this category, but there is a very small localized outbreak in Bennington at a facility where the majority of people actually are not 
positive, but there were a small number that were positive. Was it in a neighborhood or something, or a family, or? Uh, a congregate living setting. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. A what setting? A congregate living setting. Oh, I see, okay. Um, can you give us any more details, which, where it was? Uh, in, in Bennington. Okay. Um, That's all. And uh, along those lines. Yes. So why not? Why, why do we not test every person in a prison or long-term care facility, rather than waiting until someone has symptoms or gets sick? Is that because of the number of tests we have available? Yeah, that's a great question. The fact of the matter is, um, I, I would say that we probably would have enough tests available if that were our chosen tech. Uh, for that kind of major testing across all facilities, staff and residents, um, we would really want to think ahead of time and try to do what is best public health practice and guidance. And right now, um, at least from the Centers for Disease Control, that is not the best public health guidance. We actually are piloting with them a very aggressive testing program that involves new admissions to any of the facilities or that involves um, if a positive were to be found. And it's not just testing everybody in the facility, but it's testing four times actually uh, in a, in a two-week period. Um, so that part is not standard practice either. It's a pilot that we and the CDC are working on together, um, and it's very aggressive. But the CDC, to this point in time, uh, has not uh, actually guided states in testing every facility on a blanket basis. And I think you've heard Secretary Smith talk in the past um, that, sure, we could do that, but that would give us the reassurance on that one day that a facility had no infections. Um, and that could change within a day or two uh, based on someone bringing the infection into the facility. So you'd have to decide then, you know, do you do that several times a week, uh, forever and ever, uh, throughout this epidemic, or what? So that's why we're following the practice we're following now. Okay, thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Hi, um, I just have a quick question. So I was wondering, um, last, well, on Friday you announced that um, child care uh, will be able to start up again in summer camps and we can be expecting to see guidelines about that this week. I was just wondering um, when those guidelines will be coming out. Secretary Smith. Sure, I didn't expect this question on Monday, uh, but <laughs> we are um, we're hoping to get them out this week. Probably you'll see uh, um, at least on the child care center centers probably uh, midweek to Thursday on the, those, but maybe even before. I know they're working on it. I have a meeting this afternoon on where we are on the guidance, so I don't have a specific answer for you right now. It probably won't be today, but um, I would say soon, probably midweek. Okay, thank, thank you so much. All right, Liam, VPR. Hi, Governor. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were, you'd be planning to extend the, um, the state of emergency on Friday, and I was wondering if people should also expect that you'll be extending the stay-at-home order. I think you'll see a, a combination uh, in the in the future. On Friday, uh, we will be extending the state of emergency. Uh, that's the vehicle we need to make sure that we roll out some of uh, this, uh, uh, the openings and phases, like we, the approach we've taken thus far. And um, so, I, I would I would assume um, again we'll get through this week and continue to watch the data and the science and talk to all the experts. Uh, but I would say that you would see, see a relaxation, uh, uh, relaxation of that as well, uh, that we will be going 
to something uh, something less than the stay home, stay safe uh, order that's in place today. Okay, but still, it, it sounds like some there there will be some guidance uh, re restricting people's movement to some degree. It seems like. Yeah, I mean, we, this again, we don't want to throw the switch uh, on and uh, and allow everything to go back to normal like we had two or three months ago. Uh, we are very much still watching this uh, virus, uh, the tremendous uh, uh, spread, uh, the transmission of this has been uh, so quick uh, that we want to make sure we stay on top of this. So uh, again, I, would, I think you should expect uh, that we want people to limit their travels, limit their interaction, uh, making sure that we're uh, not, uh, that we're social distancing and we're not uh, getting into congregate settings uh, so that we can prevent the spread from happening uh, quickly. So you'll see a variance of what we have in place, but uh, but I would say that there's going to be uh, some relaxing of that order. Okay. Um, and, and with these new um, retail businesses that will be allowed to open, um, will you be conducting sort of any sort of compliance checks to make sure they're abiding by the order, similar to what you did with the um, hotels at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, again, what we're, what we're asking is uh, for each individual business and sector to come up with their own plans uh, that they have to adhere to and abide by. And uh, so uh, if we see that there is a situation where they're not abiding by the, by the plan, we'll ask them for the plan and, and then take action from there, giving more guidance and, uh, and hopefully uh, that they will do the right thing uh, because it's really important. Uh, we put these plans into place to, to protect both the employees and the employers as well as the uh, customers that come through the doors. So we want to make sure that they adhere to the plan that they put in place. We've asked them for this and uh, they've done so willingly and so we expect them uh, to make sure that they follow the plan that they've, they've uh, put into place and they've submitted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Elizabeth Murray, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, this uh, question is for Commissioner Levine and it, it kind of goes along with um, one of the, the figures that you mentioned earlier about how almost 100% of individuals develop symptoms within 11 days um, of uh, contracting the virus. Um, we actually obtained an advisory um, that was sent from the health department to healthcare providers saying that in light of this, now the recommended period for quarantine after coming into contact with a COVID positive patient was now 12 days instead of 14. And I was wondering why this distinction was being made for healthcare providers, why it's not also 14 or 12 for the general public. Um, so. Sure. So we're actually going to be <laughs> trying to simplify life completely and have it be 14 days period, but still with this opportunity to be tested on or after day seven, and if negative, remain off of quarantine. Keep in mind that if you are on a quarantine, you are going to be uh, being followed by the health department as part of contact tracing, and you'll be on the SARA alert system, which um, we're using for that purpose, which feeds out information to you as the end user uh, regarding symptoms to report, regarding education about the virus, uh, regarding what you should or shouldn't be doing as part of quarantine, uh, and also allows you on a daily basis to refer back to those in the health department to inform them if anything has changed about your condition. So, so I'm sorry, just to help me understand, so you're going to simplify it so that the the quarantine period for everyone is 14 days, or did you mean 12 yes, days? 14, because 14 it seems days. like this is a change. Yeah, we'll be coming out with an updated health advisory. Okay, for the health care providers? Correct. All right, thank you. Patricia Bennington Banner. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead, Patricia. 
Oh, thank you. I have a, a similar question to uh, one that was asked a, a little while back here. This might be for Dr. Levine. Uh, I think it was Lisa who asked the question regarding uh, the increase in Bennington at a congregate living facility. I know you mentioned there was a, a very small localized outbreak. And I'm wondering, um, was the reported outbreak at the Bennington School for Girls? Some people know it as VPI. Uh, yes. Well, it's the Bennington School for Girls. And um, has everyone at that location been tested? Both oh. staff and uh, both staff, residents? <clears throat> both staff and residents. Okay. And all, all of them have been tested? Correct. And I think you, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Levine, um, that you, you actually don't know um, if all five of the increase in cases in Bennington is from that site. You, you don't know if that's the case. That's correct. I, I don't know each one of those five is from there, um, mm -hmm. but I do know that there were positives from there and that the majority residents and staff were negative. So did, uh, did more uh, residents and staff test positive than, than um, the ones that had originally triggered the outbreak? I don't believe so. You don't believe any more tested positive? I'd have to relook at all of our data because it's now several days old. Okay. Do you know when um, all the residents and staff were tested? Like over a couple of days or over like one day this past weekend? Or? It was end, end of the week and uh, the weekend. As you might end of have, the week <clears throat> and the weekend. Right. End of the week and the weekend, I'm sorry? End of the week and the weekend. Because oh, as, as you, you might imagine, not all the staff are there every day. Yeah, of course. Bonnie, thank you. Cat WCAX. Hello, this question is about personal care industries, the you know hair and nail salons, spas, et cetera. When might those reopen? And given some of the services that they offer and the level of contact that's required for those, is it actually possible for them to reopen safely? Well, I'm not sure when we'll be opening those entities, uh, but, uh, but obviously it's something that's on the list. Uh, we're hoping to do this in phases. Um, I might ask uh, Dr. Levine, I think, it's difficult. I mean, those that are in close contact, uh, whether they be uh, chiropractors, massage therapists, or uh, hair salons and so forth, are in a direct con a contact. So that is a concern uh, to us. So that's why they haven't been opened up thus far. But knowing uh, that we're going to continue to do what we can in phases uh, while watching the data and the science, uh, that, that will be one entity uh, that we'll take a look at in the future. So, uh, and maybe this might be a question that Lindsay Curley could help with. What kind of conversations are happening right now in the restart group around this and around this, you know, how we might keep um, people who work in those industries safe when we go back? Like, what are some of the ideas that are being discussed? Uh, Kat, can I have uh, Dr. Levine uh, answer part of that first question and then uh, Secretary oh, Curley? Oh, sure, yeah, answer. absolutely. Sure. Yeah, hi. Um, so, as you appropriately uh, apprise the situation, it is a close contact circumstance. Uh, but having said that, all of the rules that we use for everywhere still go into effect, whether it be socially distancing when possible, masking, personal hygiene, respiratory etiquette, all of that uh, continues. The reason you certainly are seeing across the country a heterogeneity of when hairdressers are reopened or not, when healthcare is reopened or not. Uh, some of it makes sense, some of it you would say, I wonder why that state did this and this state does that. I can tell you that in our state, um, caref we're doing this very, very carefully and we just reopened a sector, healthcare, where there is abundant person-to-person uh, -person interaction. Uh, whether you're uh, sitting in a uh, physician's clinic, whether you're uh, in an operating room, 
uh, or wherever. Uh, so the opportunities to have more uh, close contact that can't be avoided are occurring. So our goal is to really see how that does or does not have an impact on the data that we collect, you know, on a continuing basis and make sure that, um, if you will, there's no early warning alarm that goes off based on the fact that uh, we've created more opportunities for people to be close to one another in those limited circumstances. So that's why, as the governor says, uh, the phased approach uh, is the cautious approach. And Kat, what was your follow-up question for Secretary Curley? <coughs> Right. The follow-up question um, was, you know, what kinds of conversations are happening in the restart group around this right now? Kind of what guidance is being discussed, you know, that might uh, ease some of the fears among, I think, some people who would like to return back to work but are really concerned about whether that's possible to do safely. You know, for instance, I can imagine a situation where someone's getting a facial per se, they're probably not wearing their mask for that. So how do you, how do you kind of balance all those very specific needs when you're doing this kind of restart guidance. Yes, yeah, so hi Kat, it's uh, Secretary Curley here. I, uh, I appreciate the ask. We are, um, as Dr. Levine mentioned, there's a whole host of things that we're looking at in this restart. But at the agency, we started by asking the team there to work with experts around the state to offer input about how they work and the type of work that they offer. So. As you can imagine, we've accumulated a lot of information, and this would would very much um, lend to a, a very phased opening. So again, I can't comment yet on exactly which aspects would be um, would be encouraged to open in the, the early phases, but we do recognize that this one's a really tricky one. Um, we're getting probably as many people that are anxious and ready to get started from an employer's perspective as, as ones that are anxious about it. So um, we're, we're very much working on how this would, would look. And um, when the governor gets to the announcement, it would be a situation where he would be permitting um, certain aspects of the industry to start their phase opening with lots of health and safety guidelines around it. So um, again, he wouldn't be forcing anybody to do it if they can't do it safely. Got it. The question stemmed from, you know, I mean, use the analogy for healthcare, but, you know, obviously a lot of most, I would say, healthcare workers are trained in, you know, professionally in avoiding cross contamination and things like that, where I don't know that that's the case for every single person who works in a personal care industry. So I was, I think we got a lot of the similar inquiries that you were hearing from people who were concerned about that. Yes, understood. And if I could just pipe in quickly again. Um, these conversations are very broad, and most of the industries, whether they be uh, the dentists, as we heard earlier, or even hairdressers, most of them are actually thinking very um, intensively about this because it goes across the country and across their discipline, and they all have professional organizations. And they're actually coming through with some very, very uh, cautious as well as uh, well-informed uh, suggestions and guidance for those in their industry that we can review and uh, take into consideration as we make decisions. And public health is definitely always at the table, uh, so none of these decisions have been uh, in a void, if you will, um, without having public health able to uh, at least help shed some light on the important issues. Thanks for those questions. Thank you. Cat, I will say <clears throat> this is uh, what happens when we're trying to make some of these decisions, and that's why we have to base everything on the data and the science, as well as uh, the experts we have in public safety and, and in economic development, uh, but in the end, uh, within the health department. So when the epidemiologists and uh, the Dr. Levine uh, sign off on something, uh, we have comfort uh, that it's gone through all of that uh, to come to the decisions uh, that we are, we are taking today. So. Uh, it's a, a long process, it's not perfect, uh, and we always try to contemplate the ripple effect and the comfort and the safety of those who are going to be uh, put into that, that setting. All right, Colin, VT Digger. 
Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I had a, a follow-up question on the uh, Bennington cases. Um, I was wondering, when was the first case identified at the Vermont School for Girls, um, and how, how did that come about, and how quickly was the blanket testing done? I can't give you the exact date, but it was mid to late last week. And as I've alluded to earlier, we have a pretty much blanket rule that any congregate living situation like that, whether it be a nursing home, whether it be a school for young women, whether it be a correctional facility, doesn't really matter. It triggers an immediate uh, response from public health that staff and residents get tested. Thanks. Um, and then if, uh, about this latest order reopening retail, I'm wondering if big box stores will be allowed to sell non-essential items again? Yes. Yes, it'll be uh, opening up the retail 25% uh, if everything goes right. I mean, this is just something that uh, I want people to be prepared for next week. Uh, but if something changes during the week, uh, it won't be put in the order. This is not an order we're signing today. It'll be part of the order on Friday. Thank you. And then Secretary Smith, I was wondering if you could speak about um, how the state's dealing with homeless populations. I know some of the leases uh, were set to expire in the next few days um, on the hotels, that there's some downsizing in Burlington. And I'm just wondering, uh, can you sort of assure people that the status quo will continue beyond this week? Well, this new status quo, I guess. Well, this new status quo will continue for the short term. We do have to think of a long-term plan here uh, because we cannot have people in uh, motels as the permanent solution for homeless uh, in, in the future. So uh, for the status quo will continue here for the short term. But there are plans now, and again, I'm, I'm meeting on this as well uh, this afternoon, sort of developing plans for the long-term status of how do we address homelessness here in Vermont. Yeah. And when you say short-term, are we talking about two weeks or two months, or what, what, what do you view that as? I, I don't have a specific uh, answer to that. We'll just have to see um, how, things, uh, how things progress, both with the virus and uh, with our planning as we as we move people uh, out of these uh, out of these facilities if hotels are allowed to start taking reservations again in the middle of june would you say that something needs to change before then i'm not going to speculate on that I, I think probably we would like to see a solution I, I'll, I'll say this colin we would like to see a solution as quick as possible on moving people to more um, permanent housing. What that permanent housing looks like, um, uh, you know, may vary in terms of what we what we're looking at. But going back to shelters or that sort of thing, those are the things that we're looking at right now. And we'd like to do as as expeditiously as possible, but as safely as possible. And right now, um, I, I you asked me if if there was any immediate um, plans to move them out. The answer is no. Well, I appreciate your time and everyone else's. Thank you. Uh, Mike, True North reports. Thank you. I just have uh, two quick questions about the proposal for sending out um, absentee ballots to all Vermonters on the board rolls. So the status quo is currently any Vermonter who deems the virus a concern for going to the polls can ask for one from either their town clerk or the Secretary of State's office. I spoke with one clerk this morning who said it is not a prohibitive process at all. So my question, my first question is, why would we need to change that system? Well, again, probably a better question for the Secretary of State. Uh, this is part of his plan. Uh, I believe that is going to be uh, the case uh, for uh, the uh, primary in August, uh, that it will continue to be as traditional that you could ask for a ballot by absentee um, requests uh, and uh, it'll be the same and the and the polls will be open uh, status quo so I'm not sure that there's going to be any change for the primary uh, I think uh, the the concern uh, for the Secretary of State is what happens in in November and there's so many 
uh, people who may need an absentee ballot because we do have a, a fairly robust system in place right now. Uh, I, I believe, again, you should probably ask him, but I, I believe his concern is that the uh, the system, the town clerks will be overwhelmed at that point if, if everyone was requesting an absentee ballot. Um, and a quick follow-up, um, will your administration be looking at how elections are being done in other nations? For example, it's being reported uh, yesterday in Reuters that South Korea, a nation that does not allow any mail-in ballots for um, election security concerns, they recently had their elections and there was no new uptick in COVID cases. Again, I, I think that's probably a better question for the experts. Uh, I rely on our health experts uh, for questions like that. I'll, I'll let the, uh, the election experts uh, ask or uh, answer that in the Secretary of State's office. I would say the legislature will have some time as well if they want to uh, contemplate a different way of conducting elections here in the state. We've been able to, uh, to utilize both forms, the absentee ballots has been quite successful uh, and there's been more and more people using those over the years and uh, so that system is in place we're we're fortunate to have that um, but uh, but I don't know if there's a, a wholesale change uh, that is going to be have the appetite of anyone at this point but but that's probably a better question with the legislature as well as uh, as the uh, Secretary of State thank you Guy Page Governor, can you tell me uh, how many complaints have been made using the executive order reporting tool uh, put out by the state police and um, how that's worked? I can ask, I don't know myself, but uh, I don't know, is Commissioner Sherling on the line? Uh, Commissioner Sherling had to, yeah, this is Erica Borneman, uh, Director of Vermont Emergency Management. Commissioner Sherling had to uh, attend another meeting. Um, I don't have uh, the current statistics, but that's something we can uh, follow up on. We can get that to you, Guy. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Okay, thanks very much again for tuning in, and we'll see you on Wednesday.